Chapter 6, Part 1 Teddy Kent and Ilsa Burnley came home in the summer for a brief vacation. Teddy had won an art scholarship, which meant two years in Paris, and was to sail for Europe in two weeks. He had written the news to Emily in an offhand way, and she had responded with the congratulations of a friend and sister. There was no reference in either letter to Rainbow Gold or Vega of the Lyre. Yet Emily looked forward to his coming with a wistful, ashamed hope that would not be denied. Perhaps, dared she hope it, when they met again face to face in their old haunted woods and trysts, this coldness that had grown up so inexplicably between them would vanish as a sea fog vanishes when the sun rose over the gulf. No doubt Teddy had had his imitation love affairs as she had hers. But when he came, when they looked again into each other's eyes, when she heard his signal whistle in Lofty John's bush. But she never heard it. On the evening of the day when she knew Teddy was expected home, she walked in the garden among brocaded moths, wearing a new gown of powder blue chiffon, and listened for it. Every robin call brought the blood to her cheek and made her heart beat wildly. Then came Aunt Laura through the dew and dusk. Teddy and Ilsa are here, she said. Emily went in to the stately, stiff, dignified parlor of New Moon, pale, queenly, aloof. Ilsa hurled herself upon her with all her old, tempestuous affection. But Teddy shook hands with a cool detachment that almost equaled her own. Teddy? Oh dear, no. Frederick Kent, R.A. to be. What was there left of the old Teddy in this slim, elegant young man with his sophisticated air and cool, impersonal eyes, and general implication of having put off forever all childish things, including foolish old visions and insignificant little country girls he had played with in his infancy? In which conclusion Emily was horribly unjust to Teddy, but she was not in a mood to be just to anybody. Nobody is who has made a fool of herself. And Emily felt that that was just what she had done, again. Mooning romantically about in a twilight garden, specially wearing powder blue, waiting for a lover's signal from a beau who had forgotten all about her, or only remembered her as an old schoolmate on whom he had very properly and kindly and conscientiously come to call. Well, thank heaven, Teddy did not know how absurd she had been. She would take excellent care that he should never suspect it. Who could be more friendly and remote than a Murray of New Moon? Emily's manner, she flattered herself, was admirable as gracious and impersonal as to an entire stranger. Renewed congratulations on his wonderful success, coupled with an absolute lack of all real interest in it. Carefully phrased polite questions about his work on her side. Carefully phrased polite questions about her work on his side. She had seen some of his pictures in the magazines. He had read some of her stories. So it went, with a wider gulf opening between them at every moment. Never had Emily felt herself so far away from Teddy. She recognized with a feeling that was almost terror how completely he had changed in those two years of absence. It would, in truth, have been a ghastly interview had it not been for Ilsa, who chattered with all her old breeziness and tang, 
planning out a two weeks of gay doings while she was home, asking hundreds of questions. The same lovable old madcap of laughter and jest, and dressed with all her old gorgeous violations of accepted canons of taste. In an extraordinary dress, a thing of greenish yellow. She had a big pink peony at her waist and another at her shoulder. She wore a bright green hat with a wreath of pink flowers on it. Great hoops of pearls swung in her ears. It was a weird costume. No one but Ilsa could have worn it successfully. And she looked like the incarnation of a thousand tropic springs in it. Exotic, provocative, beautiful. So beautiful. Emily realized her friend's beauty afresh, with a pang, not of envy, but of bitter humiliation. Beside Ilsa's golden sheen of hair and brilliance of amber eyes and red rose loveliness of cheeks, she must look pale and dark and insignificant. Of course Teddy was in love with Ilsa. He had gone to see her first, had been with her while Emily waited for him in the garden. Well, it made no real difference. Why should it? She would be just as friendly as ever. And was. Friendly with a vengeance. But when Teddy and Ilsa had gone, together, laughing and teasing each other through the old tomorrow road, Emily went up to her room and locked the door. Nobody saw her again until the next morning. Part two. The gay two weeks of Ilsa's planning followed. Picnics, dances, and jamborees galore. Shrewsbury Society decided that a rising young artist was somebody to be taken notice of and took notice accordingly. It was a veritable whirl of gaiety and Emily whirled about in it with the others. No step lighter in the dance, no voice quicker in the jest, and all the time feeling like the miserable spirit in a ghost story she had once read, who had a live coal in its breast instead of a heart. All the time feeling, too, far down under surface pride and hidden pain, that sense of completion and fulfillment which always came to her when Teddy was near her. But she took good care never to be alone with Teddy, who certainly could not be accused of any attempt to inveigle her into two sums. His name was freely coupled with Ilsa's, and they took so composedly the teasing they encountered that the impression gained ground that things were pretty well understood between them. Emily thought Ilsa might have told her if it were so. But Ilsa, though she told many a tale of lovers forlorn whose agonies seemed to lie very lightly on her conscience, never mentioned Teddy's name, which Emily thought had a torturing significance of its own. She inquired after Perry Miller, wanting to know if he were as big an oaf as ever and laughing over Emily's indignant defense. He will be premier someday, no doubt, agreed Ilsa scornfully. He'll work like the devil and never miss anything by lack of asking for it. But won't you always smell the herring barrels of Stovepipe Town? Perry came to see Ilsa, bragged a bit too much over his progress, and got so snubbed and manhandled that he did not come again. Altogether, the two weeks seemed like a nightmare to Emily, who thought she was unreservedly thankful when the time came for Teddy to go. He was going on a sailing vessel to Halifax, wanting to make some nautical sketches for a magazine. And an hour before flood tide, while the Mira Lee swung at anchor by the wharf at Stovepipe Town, he came to say goodbye. He did not bring Ilsa with him, 
no doubt, thought Emily, because Ilsa was visiting in Charlottetown. But Dean Priest was there, so there was no dreaded solitude, adieu. Dean was creeping back into his own, after the two weeks' junketings from which he had been barred out. Dean would not go to dances and clam bakes, but he was always hovering in the background, as everybody concerned felt. He stood with Emily in the garden, and there was a certain air of victory and possession about him that did not escape Teddy's eye. Dean, who never made the mistake of thinking gaiety was happiness, had seen more than others of the little drama that had been played out in Blairwater during those two weeks. And the dropping of the curtain left him a satisfied man. The old shadowy childish affair between Teddy Kent of the Tansy Patch and Emily of New Moon was finally ended. Whatever its significance or lack of significance had been, Dean no longer counted Teddy among his rivals. Emily and Teddy parted with the hearty handshake and mutual good wishes of old schoolmates, who do indeed wish each other well, but have no very vital interest in the matter. Prosper and be hanged to you, as some old Murray had been wont to say. Teddy got himself away very gracefully. He had the gift of making an artistic exit, but he did not once look back. Emily turned immediately to Dean and resumed the discussion which Teddy's coming had interrupted. Her lashes hid her eyes very securely. Dean, with his uncanny ability to read her thoughts, should not, must not guess. What? What was there to guess? Nothing, absolutely nothing. Yet Emily kept her lashes down. When Dean, who had some other engagement that evening, went away half an hour later, she paced sedately up and down among the gold of primroses for a little while. The very incarnation, in all seeming, of maiden meditation Fancy free. Spinning out a plot, no doubt, thought Cousin Jimmy proudly, as he glimpsed her from the kitchen window. It beats me how she does it. Part 3 Perhaps Emily was spinning out a plot. But as the shadows deepened, she slipped out of the garden, through the dreamy peace of the old columbine orchard, along the yesterday road, over the green pasture field, past the Blairwater, up the hill beyond, past the disappointed house, through the thick fir wood. There, in a clump of silver birches, one had an unbroken view of the harbor, flaming in lilac and rose color. Emily reached it a little breathlessly, she had almost to run at the last. Would she be too late? Oh, what if she should be too late? The Mira Lee was sailing out of the harbor, a dream vessel in the glamour of sunset, past purple headlands and distant fairy-like misty coasts. Emily stood and watched her till she had crossed the bar into the gulf beyond. Stood and watched her until she had faded from sight in the blue dimness of the falling night, conscious only of a terrible hunger to see Teddy once more, just once more, to say goodbye as it should have been said. Teddy was gone to another world. There was no rainbow in sight. And what was Vega of the liar but a whirling, flaming, incredibly distant sun? She slipped down among the grasses at her feet and lay there sobbing in the cold moonshine 
that had suddenly taken the place of the friendly twilight. Mingled with her sharp agony was incredulity. This thing could not have happened. Teddy could not have gone away with only that soulless, chilly, polite goodbye. After all their years of comradeship, if nothing else, oh, how would she ever get herself past three o'clock this night? I am a hopeless fool, she whispered savagely. He has forgotten. I am nothing to him. And I deserve it. Didn't I forget him in those crazy weeks when I was imagining myself in love with Aylmer Vincent? Of course somebody has told him all about that. I've lost my chance of real happiness through that absurd affair. Where is my pride? To cry like this over a man who has forgotten me. But, but, it's so nice to cry after having to laugh for these hideous weeks.' 